Hi, good morning and welcome to the ZP Developer Zone. We do this webinar every um, Thursday at approximately 8 a.m. London time. And we generally try to answer sort of technical questions, keep it very technical around um, questions around screen printed electrodes, biosensors, um, electrochemistry. So let me essentially jump straight into it. I will, um, and we've, uh, so let me just jump straight into it, yeah. So I put this slide up every week. We do have the ZP Academy and we have a lot of registrations on there. We do have um, two free courses available. I just want to say hi, good morning to Aftab who's online and you, you'd be there. Uh, so we have the ZP Academy and we do have this, at least this webinar um, once a week. And um, we also have a vlog on Sundays at 8 a.m. London time. We do have collaborations. I've just had an email in this morning um, asking for a PhD to come in from India and do an intern with us. So I've, I have responded to that. Um, we do offer jobs through this academy and we obviously have the web, um, the website as well. And in the website, there's a forum and we generally go through the forum looking for questions that are interesting and then we answer them here. So last week, um, oh, and by the way, we also do have workshops as well. Now, a lot of these workshops at the moment are um, online, but we have done one just a couple of weeks ago. I think it was really well um, received. We did a workshop um, with an e-conference in India and there we did quite a few um, demonstrations and I think you know it generally was well received so thank you to those organizers. Um, as I say we have a ZP developers own website where there's a forum for Q&A's and um, we'd actually missed a question and so it was really thanks to um, Technando who had actually highlighted look there's a question that um, has actually come in from India again um, and they want to know about immunosensors. Um, I think immunosensors at this moment are, have always been relevant, but with, um, unfortunately, with SARS-CoV-2, you know, immunosensors are kind of even more, um, let's say, I don't want to say popular, but even more important than ever. Now, what's interesting about this inquiry is um, they're actually looking to do one to 1,000 picograms per milliliter. So one picogram per milliliter is pretty challenging, uh, but we'll touch upon that um, today. Now, they were asking, you know, what SPEs would you recommend? Um, and so we're going to talk about um, gold SPEs, gold screen printed electrodes, and also um, carbon screen printed electrodes. And I'll show you that we've used both. Uh, I think on balance, I'm going to come slightly on the favor of, on the favor of carbon screen printed electrodes. But... Um, first of all, let's talk about making an immunosensor on a gold screen printed electrode. So now there's one step here where I'm going to basically take you through, you know, how we often do a functionalization of gold electrode. But I realize there's one important step that I've missed out. But the first thing I so show here is that we're going to immobilize um, a thiol onto the surface of a gold. You know, this is self assembled monolayers. I do have a, a, a slide in a minute that says, the first thing you have to do is actually clean gold surfaces. Gold surfaces, we can make them as pristine as you like, but gold does tarnish, really, you know, it's not that you can see it by eye, but as soon as you make a pristine gold surface and you expose it to the atmosphere, it's starting to tarnish. Not terribly, it doesn't become all dark and stuff, but actually it's enough to affect a biosensor. So. The first thing you must do when you get a gold screen printed electrode is to clean it. And we do have a cleaning video and I'll show you how to do it. Uh, but after that then, then it's time to create that um, self-assembled sort of monolayer. So here we put um, some MCH on the surface of it. The next thing that we want to do is we want to activate it to couple it. So we do um, an EDC NHS um, coupling. This is really you know fairly standard and quite straightforward. So we activate the carboxylic acid group and then we can um, incubate it with the antibodies so that the antibody then um, tethers um, to the surface. Now what we don't want to do is um, we don't want to have non-specific binding. So what we do is we block the surface then often with um, BSA, bovine serum albumin. So this is a kind of protocol that you know we follow fairly routinely at ZP and um, the good thing about it, um, it's, you know, it, it's worked for us quite successfully. 
Now the sensor testing process for us is that we will take that now antibody activated um, biosensor. We will incubate it with the protein. I just want to say hi to uh, Nidia. Nice to see you this morning, Nidia. Um, so we act, we um, incubate the biosensor with the um, with the antigen or the virus or the bacteria, and so we get that specific binding. The next thing we do is we rinse it. So we want to rinse away the non-specific um, binding element. And I also want to say hi to Bart so this morning. Thank you for joining us. So we do um, rinse away then the non-specific binding material. And then we test it. Now we often test these sensors with a solution of um, made up of about five millimolar ferro and five millimolar ferricyanide. Um, now, so we make the sensor. And so when I was describing that we make that gold electrode, the things I said were, we do, first of all, clean the gold surface. And I, I do have a video and a link for you on that. Then we put the thiol layer down on there. So the sulfur sticks to the surface of the gold and the carboxylic acid is essentially pointing upwards. Then we activate the, that carboxylic acid with EDC and NHS. Then we incubate the antibody. And um, I think then we give it essentially a wash. Now it's prepared. We're ready to now test it. And this is what this slide is about. It says we incubate with a target analyte. We rinse it. Then we test it, and we often put a redox reporter in there of something like five millimolar ferrocyanide, five millimolar, millimolar ferrocyanide, and then we test the sensor. Because the principle that we often use is um, EIS. I am going to also talk to you about differential pulse voltammetry, um, square wave voltammetry, um, and I'll touch upon EIS as well. So if you've got a blank electrode, the material. Um, the, the redox reporter, you know, the, like the ion center, for example, can just hit the surface. Once you put your um, antibody layer down on there, the surface is somewhat blocked. And then when your um, when your analyte um, binds the surface, the surface is even more blocked. So if you're looking at the kind of a Bode plot, the capacitive element is increasing all the time. So the more binding here, the more capacitive elements um, we actually have. And, you know, this is something I got from the literature, you know, sort of showing the progression from a bare sensor all the way through to something that's been um, bound to. Now, the way we do our data analysis is we like to analyze immunosensors using EIS, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. And that's the way we like to do it. So we would build up a, um, a model like this. It's um, a cool equivalent circuit. The first element in the model will tell us something about the solution resistance. Um, these elements here, this capacitive and resistance here, tell us the linker. That was that the linker was that um, was the thiol group that first attached to the surface. And then the things that are interesting to us are actually um, these elements here: the phase angle, the capacitive capacitance, and the resistor. So these are the things for us that generally tell us the antigen is binding and how much of the antigen is actually um, bound. Um, and you can do this analysis in Julie. The gold electro that we that we suggest, these days it's blue, don't let that upset you, but it's, it's the gold 303. Um, we have used it. Now, I'm, um, Nidia, I'm not ignoring the fact that actually you want to do one picogram to 1000 picograms per milliliter. So that is challenging. I'm not gonna, I can't sit here and deny that. Now we um, are generally, you know, well not generally. In this application, we've tested from five nanograms to 75 nanograms per milliliter. Um, you know, so you're at, you know, at your upper range, you're kind of here, let's say on, on this semicircle, you're really, um, you know, 1000 picograms, is obviously one nanogram per milliliter. So you know, you are significantly below us um, and it's going to be challenging. And, you know, that that is the science of it. Um, what do you need? Um, you'll need. I think um, you'll need if you do the EIS route, you'll need an Anapot EIS um, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy spectrometer. There's a link for it there. It's a good idea to have these connectors. Um, I find that 
people sometimes get bad data just because they're not connected properly to the um, electrodes so that we have um, it's a seven millimeter connector um, on that link and I clearly say it's the seven millimeter connector not not the 10 millimeter connector um, and then the gold electrodes themselves and then as I say when yesterday when I was thinking about this I realized that I'd forgotten one thing which was you need to um, clean those electrodes before use not because we're making them bad it's just by the time they've shipped and they've gone through customs and they've sat on the shelf they will have start, started picking up um, material on their surface um, at which point um, you have a quick look at this video um, and it'll show you how to sort of um, rejuvenate the surface and make it good again. If budget is tight, then I'm going to slightly suggest that you go towards the um, carbon electrodes. Um, the reason being the carbon electrodes are a fraction of the cost of the gold electrodes. That's a good start. We have used the carbon electrodes um, ourselves um, to do immunosensors and they work really well and this is a paper that myself um, and a couple uh, and another colleague were on um, and it is an immuno sensor on a carbon electrode and these days I definitely um, we are definitely using our hyper value carbon electrodes in that process and what's interesting is carbon in some ways is more inert than gold that it doesn't you know we don't polish or clean the surface before we use it we just use it but whereas gold we definitely have to highly recommend that you do clean the surface first um, so what we do is um, we take our I suppose in some ways we maybe we do clean the surface because we do like to characterize the surface first of all with a bit of cyclovoltametry to make sure it's good now when you do a process like that you're probably inadvertently cleaning it um, now what we do is we build up layers on the surface and what we're you what we're doing is um, we're using a um, I think this is I want to say have my slip me for a second now but um, we're using this um, four um, ring aromatic ring and um, pyrene uh, maybe and it's got a linking molecule on it. Now, I suppose I should say that, you know, it is referenced um, in the paper what we're, what we're using. Um, but what we're doing is we're using this aromatic ring because that will bind very well to the carbon surface because it will do sort of pi-pi stacking. And then we have a linker molecule on there. And so the linker molecule ends up being on the surface. And we follow each step by a bit of cycle of voltammetry. So every time we do a sort of a little change, we see the CV change and it gives us confidence that we are modifying the surface. Having, um, so the, the, the coupling in some ways is quite quick because you've just got a carbon surface, you bring in this material, it just stacks on top of the carbon. Um, and now you can bring in your antibody and that will couple to that. And then we do, um, block the surface again to stop non-specific binding and we sort of follow the process as i say by cyclovoltametry and the, uh, the more layers we lay up the more distorted the cyclovoltametry becomes it's becoming distorted because you're essentially increasing the capacitance and the resistance of the surface because you're um, layering up all these um, layers on top of it and then we're ready to test it now this is kind of unusual because now we have um, a carbon surface blocked with BSA um, we've got the antibody on the surface of it and in the paper they use or we use differential pulse voltammetry and it's a slightly unusual um, effect here because um, when the electrode is bare we get one um, sort of let's say peak don't worry that the peak is inverted it's just that we they were running this in a sort of cathodic mode rather than an anodic mode but it's the magnitude of the peak that's important and then they sort of add in some um, HCG and the signal goes up that's you know fairly unusual because this feels like a blocking assay you know that you're essentially blocking the surface but it just tells you that there's an interaction probably between the HCG and the redox reporter that's actually allowing the redox reporter to get down to the surface that might be an electrostatic um, attraction and then they add in some more and the signal essentially increases accordingly so it's a good idea maybe in some ways before you start on 
like say your target it's probably a good idea just just to follow a standard paper and make sure that you've kind of you know you can follow that or maybe even get a student to do it because i know it's a bit it's a bit achy to sort of have to re just repeat somebody else's paper but if you're new to it maybe um it's not a bad idea let's say um and that's the original like say you know work so i you know so it, it was unusual that the higher the um concentration the greater the signal which would have been un which is unusual for me because actually it was a blocking assay and that was done by differential pulse voltammetry so let me make some comments um when we're functionalizing these electrodes we often follow it by a cycle of voltammetry it's nice and quick just see that things are changing but if we're analyzing it then i used to like square wave voltammetry i used to like differential pulse voltammetry and these days i quite like eis electrochemical impedance spectroscopy um um you know, it's just because it always, not always, but it, it works. What it, what EIS does see is it ends up giving you um, a lot of features in your data. And so if there's lots of features, you can find that feature in your data that's best correlated with the analyte of interest. Um, and that's why we kind of like EIS. In order to repeat that paper, uh, if you don't go the EIS route, there is a lower cost route, then you don't have to have... Um, you can have what's called an anapot rather than an anapot EIS, and I'll put a link in for that. Again, you need the seven millimeter connector, and you do need um, hypervalued carbon electrodes. It feels like a lower cost route, and the reason being is um, these things are the car. These carbon electrodes are a, a fraction of the cost of the gold electrodes. Um, now, when we're functionalizing this, when we're doing this kind of work, it's probably worth saying that, you know, well, when we're functionalizing testing, we might start off with something like 60 electrodes. We might test them, make sure they're all good. Um, then we'll put on this pyrene NHS linker. So earlier I couldn't remember the name of that aromatic ring and it was a pyrene NHS linker. So we put that on there and we leave it at four degrees for four hours. Then we test, just make sure that things have um, sort of stuck to the surface. Then we put on the antibody and we leave that at four degrees for four whoops leave that for four degrees for four hours um then we rinse it and now we start um, actually adding the antigens and testing them add some more antigens and test it add some more antigens and test it add some more antigens and test it i mean when we go into a piece of work like that we do at least 60 experiments and um you know, just kind of know this is not a small effort to make an immunosensor, but I'm sure you know that. Um, it takes us, now we're very industrialized on this. So this data is not perfect, but it's not bad either. But we're very industrially set up. And that generally takes us about 111 hours to do that kind of work. Um, so just be warned. Um, I'm very proud of our electrodes. We do something that's very unusual. We do do wafer mapping. So all the gold electrodes that I'm recommending, we will have gone to the batch of electrodes and test them by cycle voltammetry and made sure they were good. And it's the same for the carbon electrodes. And I genuinely think we're the only company that's really doing this where we're analyzing everything, uploading our data to Julie so we can analyze it and making sure that the electrodes are actually good before they um, ship. Um, just to talk about some practicalities of functionalizing it how do we functionalize these electrodes so we sort of take these gold or these carbon electrodes and we don't swamp it everyone sort of puts a big blob of their material onto the surface like that that would be a sort of drop of like 30 microliters you know that would sort of swamp everything what we end up doing is putting tiny little something like one microliter drops along here and we actually do this by hand by the way so no excuses <laughs> we can do this by hand and our guys but of course you know they're in there day out, day in day out doing this, but that's what they do. They um, they put it on by hand if they're doing small scale, and then those drops sort of coalesce and form um, the little rectangle like that. We also have robots, which really makes it much easier. But I'm not suggesting everyone's got a robot um, to do this kind of um, work. Um, it's probably worth saying that when we say sometimes when we're drying. Um, we were saying, you know, in the if you follow the paper, it just says four degrees for four hours. You know, if we really want to get repeatability, we're actually controlling the, you know, the pressure above the sensors as well. So um, I think sometimes universities really want to get repeatability, but repeatability really comes from being a, an ISO 13485 company that's really set up for that. I think universities should give themselves the challenge of proof of principle 
um, you know, in principle, does this work? Do I have enough evidence this is working? But trying to make a manufacturing process in a lab is not easy. So you have to control conditions like the pressure above the sensor. Um, when we're doing this kind of work, we're doing it in quite high volume. And what I mean by that is we're testing, you know, things like 12 sensors at a time. You know, so we really have it industrialized, you know, and these days we've now moved it into clean room facilities as well. So we're testing in, you know, personal protection equipment, you know, to make sure that we're protecting the biosensors from ourselves, you know, bits of dust, bits of hair, all that kind of stuff is, you know, is very much taken care of. So this is the way we work in our labs to make sure that we get reproducible biosensors. So I think I'm getting close to the end here. Oh, yeah, and in fact, I am getting close to the end. So I think I've just talked for 20 minutes nonstop. So I apologize for that. So Nidia, thank you for the question. I think my recommendation is um, gold and carbon will both work for you. If you go the gold route, there is, I will put a, vid, a link under the video where you have to actually clean the gold just before you use it. The gold is more expensive. I think it's more finickety. I think the carbon is lower cost and the route is more straightforward. The biggest concern I have for your work is that one picogram per milliliter. That is challenging. And if you want to future proof your work, then I would get an Anapot EIS because then you have square wave voltammetry, differential positive voltammetry, cycle voltammetry, and you have EIS. If you don't have the budget, then just go for the Anapot, but you won't have the um, EIS capability and you have to always kind of play in the um, voltammetry, um, let's say space. I want to say again, thanks to um, Technando. They were really good. They were very diligent. They were watching the, the forum. They noticed that I, I, I missed the question last week. So my apologies um, and thank you to them. Yeah, so that's it. Um, I'm going to go downstairs, grab a cup of coffee um, and get on with some meetings. But thank you, Bart and Aftab and Nidia for um, sustaining with us today. And um, if you've got any questions, Nidia, reach out to Aftab and we'll hopefully be able to help you. Okay, take care guys and thank you very much. Cheers.